Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining me here. I want particularly to thank so many of you who've been in touch over these last few days with your messages of encouragement. And uh, I'm not going to look back at the events that have brought me into the news recently. I'm just going to look forward. A number of you have said, can you be involved? Can we share together in some kind of Christian life? And I think that's a great idea. Uh, ever since I left my parish uh, on the island of Jersey uh, a few months ago, some of my friends there have said, can we, can we continue, please, to be some kind of fellowship? And the, there are some bad things about the internet, but one of the great things about it is that it allows us to do this. So we're going to begin with a reading for, that was set for today, which is the Feast of the Presentation of Christ in the Temple. It's St Luke, chapter 22. Chapter 2, beginning at verse 22. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout and looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and he praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. And then Simeon blessed them. And he said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, uh, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher, she was of a great age, and having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. And at that moment she came and began to praise God and speak out about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they'd finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favour of God was upon him. I think I see three things in particular in that passage, and they're purity and prayer and prophecy. A lot of people don't really understand the Old Testament, and they read the Gospels and the letters uh, without putting them in a context in which they were intended to be experienced. The Old Testament for a lot of people is a place of, of violence, it's a bit primitive, and some people even think it shows a different face of God. And actually, the whole thing was an exercise in purity. It was designed to introduce people to God who made us, who loves us, but who is above all pure. And so within the law of Israel, as well as within the mouths of the prophets, there was an enormous emphasis on learning how this purity worked. And in the life of the people under the law, purity touched everything. It touched it touched even the cooking, different pots for dairy and, uh, and, and, and meat. It touched politics. There had to be the purity of justice in the political system. It touched charity. Purity had to show itself in compassion with people who were weak and on the outside. It touched sex and marriage. There had to be a, a cleanliness. And, and purity in the Old Testament was, was more about 
making a distinction between what was human and, and what was divine. Because as we find in the New Testament, God wants to bring us on a journey. He's started us as human beings, but he wants to work on us all the way through our lives to draw us slowly, inexorably into his presence, into heaven, into the world of the Spirit. And this journey is about purity. And so in the Old Testament, the people learnt about purity. A lot of people say, well, why didn't Jesus teach more about sexuality as we're contesting it in our present culture? And the answer was because sex was understood to be one of those places, just like power, where purity was required. It was just assumed uh, that that was the case. And so this journey into purity is one in which we're all called, and it's the context of life, life in the spirit. The purification that was asked for any child was a way of rehearsing exactly that experience. Everything had to be purified. The mother after childbirth, the child, him or herself, uh, as a sign that, that we were we, that the people of Israel, that everyone was being called into the presence of God to move from the human into the divine. So Jesus was presented in the temple and a ritual took place. The sacrifice was made to bring home the fact that we are separate from God and we need to be drawn closer to him. And in the temple, we have these two extraordinary people. It's wonderful the way in which God overturns the patterns of the ordinary world where we deal with, uh, with power and different kind of appetites all the time. But at this particular point, we have two elderly people apparently wandering around, wandering around driven by the Holy Spirit. It's very encouraging to know that the, the Holy Spirit is involved in the whole of the purposes of God from the moment of creation when the Spirit broods over the void. Uh, of course, to the great moment of Pentecost when the Spirit's poured out on the early church. But every so often we see the breath of the Spirit blowing people in the direction they ought to go. And two of those people were Simeon and Anna. Wonderful that at this critical moment, a woman like Anna was there prophesying, full of the Holy Spirit, telling God what was, or telling the people what was on God's mind. And so, of course, these two people, Simeon and Anna, are almost like another Adam and Eve, but, but man and woman, symbolising the praying people were in the temple. And they both were on the lookout for what God was doing. Because, of course, prayer involves a kind of purification Prayer involves a self-emptying, a, a moving our weight away from everything that's human, from the power of our words or our oratory or our brains or our, our influence, whatever, to this, this reliance of God, the carving out a space in our diary, in our time, in our heart, so that God can come in and begin to touch who we are, what we are, what we do, in order to move it from the human to the divine start carrying it the whole of our lives from earth to heaven to join earth to heaven so that heaven spills out where we are here now and so of course these two people had spent their lives praying they weren't useless they weren't uh, rejected or uh, exiled from society they were valued because prayer was understood to be at the heart of God's purpose of purification and they both prophesied to prophesy is to talk the mind of God into a situation. And both Simeon and Anna spoke God's mind into this extraordinary event, this moment when God put himself into the, into the system. And so we're called to live lives of purity. Purity is done to us by, by God, the Holy Spirit, but it requires our cooperation. We say, we say yes to him. And of course, the fact is that none of us are pure in the sense God wants us to be. We keep on falling down. And just like our clothes that get dirty and we have to be washed regularly. So by, by confession and by turning round, we let God wash us and go on with his deep clean that the kingdom of heaven is about. And I think praying is one of the hardest things. It's, it's, the, it's really the place where the life of the world and the life of the spirit collide. <clears throat> and we're all so um, we're used to the life of the world. We're so used to getting things by, by sending emails and 
picking up the telephone, telling people what's needed, that, that, that resting in God, letting go and allowing God to permeate our moments uh, is, is quite difficult. And of course, whenever we pray, we find ourselves being opposed. There is another spirit, there is another will, another intention that is very keen to stop us. And if you've ever wondered why prayer is hard, it's because it's important and this, this other entity uh, is quite determined to stop it if it's at all possible, which ought to give you a sense and me of how important it is. And then we can't all be prophets. There are different gifts of the Spirit, um, but we're all called to share in the mind of Christ so that as we follow this road of purity, as we offer ourselves to God in prayer, he is able to give us more of his mind so we can see what's going on. And we need his mind today as we're faced with political and cultural tensions and divisions and arguments and enormous clashes of, of, of ethics. We need to know what it is that God wants from us, and from the world, from anyone who's looking for him. We do that, first of all, by looking in the scriptures. And then we look to see how the scriptures have been lived and prayed. That's called tradition. And then we try and do it ourselves. So we carve out in this moment of time and space that God has put us in a little place where, where the ripples of his love move outwards and touch those amongst whom he's put us. And that's the kingdom of heaven. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for sharing uh, in this particular web page. Thank you for your prayers. All of you who write to me, I pray for you. Uh, and uh, I'm, most, I'm most grateful. So do come back um, from time to time and I hope we can continue something of this journey together in God's love. Thank you. God be with you.